You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 152, The Chariot, hosted by Dan Terry. No, everybody's out to get me. Everybody's wrong, and I am the man. I'm in a wood-paneled paradise. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Buddy Reno. I think I have to be doing something else, and I wasn't at the time, so I switched. <laughs> and Joseph Wren. Welcome to my dank dungeon. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if your closet holds no bones because the devil is in Atlanta, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe, that is Dan, that is Buddy, the Doomhammer in house, ladies and gentlemen, because the chariot cannot be ignored. This is not my first rodeo. Rodeo? (laughs) Where are you from? Yeah. (laughs) I've never heard anybody say Rodeo except for on the chariot. <laughs> and I'm kind of like Rodeo Drive, or are we like what are we doing here? I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding. I do know that Atlanta was, you know, it used to be Douglasville. You know, I, I understand all that, but uh, you know, the bullet never lies, and time will prove all things. So, well, I mean, my question is, why only one rodeo? Do, are we supposed to know what's supposed to be going on after one rodeo? I don't feel like I'm prepared. I think we should. I think we should. Uh, we should circle back next week, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> circle back. Circle back. Long uh, live. And we should come back to this, and you know, in a week, whenever we know what we're talking about. Welcome to the show this week, guys. We're talking about the chariot. You've demanded it. We've decided that this year we're going to actually start listening to what you guys want us to do. <laughs> uh, we've we've done it. We've done it in the past, but uh, we you know we decided that this week uh, we're going to give you guys the chariot, which was so quick after every time I die, so quick after Showbread uh, 2020, guys. It's going to be a year of no filler bands. We're 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 avoiding the bands that are just kind of eh, and we're going with the bands that we that we like, the bands that you guys want to hear us talk about. So I, I'm really excited for some of the stuff we have coming up this year. And I'm excited to talk about the chariot. We're bringing the beef in 2020. It's a new decade. What if you're vegan? We're bringing the beef substitute tofu. We're bringing. We're bringing the tofu. (laughs) You know, it's funny. I actually got a T-shirt last year that was uh, the Beats Killer Tofu Tour. That's amazing. I actually have that T-shirt. Yeah. Is that an offshoot of Green Jello? No, that's an offshoot of Doug, the animated series. Oh, fuck. I haven't it's seen that show. It's time for Danamaniacs. Douche. No. Well, it's definitely time for the chariot, and it's been a long time coming. I know we talked about the chariot a lot back in the Norma Jean episode, episode 100, but uh, we never really went down that path because who has the time? I had to spend two hours talking about Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child, so uh, we ran out of time to really talk a lot about the chariot. So we have given them their own episode, so uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. Well, before we stretch this one sentence into an entire book report, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan's going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Well, we do love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. We love subscribers. We love episode sharers. You guys are the guys that share the episodes when you see them on your social network. Be that Instagram. Be that Facebook. Be that Twitter. Did I run out yet? Uh, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Is there more social media? Not any that anyone cares about that won't go out of business within two months of posting. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we got true. that going for us. Uh, Joe, you actually forgot one, my friend. Uh, as of recently, we are now part of iHeartRadio. It's about damn time. I know. We've been trying to get on there forever. They're like, I don't know about you guys. There's just something weird about you. We're not sure if we want your content on our website. This just in. Pandora Podcasts now lists discography discussion. Oh, it's on Pandora Podcasts? It's everywhere. Okay, so we can actually really say anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can hear our lovely voices. And uh, we are working on ways for you to see our lovely faces. So uh, you guys can look out for that in the future if you're into that sort of thing. I mean, is that really a benefit, though? (laughs) 
It's a benefit for me, man. I mean, you got to think of how many years before I started this podcast that I would just stand there and talk to myself in the mirror. Like every single night, I'm just like, who's the man? Who's the man? Who's the man? And then, you know, the really cool dude that's standing behind me is like, eh, it's me. Hey, and I'm y'all. like, well, one of these days, people are just going to hear my voice. Who let and, Jeff in uh, the room? They're going to love it. <laughs> but you know what I love? The chariot. Because who doesn't love the chariot? So, Dan, tell me about the chariot. Well, the chariot is a hardcore. Is it a hardcore? Like a spazcore? Is that a word? Spazcore? I think it used to be a word. I don't know if it's used anymore, but they are a chaotic hardcore band uh, from, I'm going to assume, Douglasville, Atlanta. No, wait, that was stupid. Douglasville, Georgia. (laughs) And uh, yeah, or maybe they're from Atlanta. I don't know. I didn't pull it up and look at it because, you know, we're not the kind of podcast that's just going to read off of Wikipedia pages. So they're from Georgia. They are Kentucky Fried Hardcore. (laughs) And they've been banned from almost every venue you've ever been to. The Chariot is probably one of the craziest live bands I've ever seen. Because their singer, Josh, who used to sing for Norma Jean famously and now sings for 68, he has this tendency to just like throw himself on the floor, kind of jiggle around all over the floor like a snake (laughs) while he's playing, hiding behind various instruments, climbing on anything that is available to climb, anything or anyone. And uh, he has been known to hang from rafters and yep. uh, and and do all kinds of crazy things while gutterly making sounds, gurgling, screaming, yelling, talking sounds with his voice that is sometimes and sometimes not anywhere near a microphone. <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, I remember when uh, the first album came out, I believe we saw him at Oh, was it the Foo Bar? Maybe I can't remember anymore. It's so long ago, and yeah, there yeah, it was Foo Bar. Yeah, yeah, all over the floor, all over the rafters. They got in trouble because he was jumping up on to. Uh, they had like two big stacks of amps, and he almost knocked over one of the top ones. If I remember correctly, uh, it was definitely moving. Is that his <laughs> fault, or is that the person that set the amps up fault? Probably a little bit of both. I'm <laughs> pretty sure it's my fault because I got up there first. <laughs> at one point, at one point, he would like everything got real quiet, and he was like that all the lights were out, and he was swinging a lantern on a chain uh, around a circle. Uh, I might have imagined that, or I might have dreamed that, but I, I definitely I remember it as a real memory. <laughs> and that actually wasn't the first time I saw the chariot. The first time I saw the chariot was at Cornerstone. I remember me and uh, me and Mike, uh, who you guys know from Movie Mosh, uh, Mike and I went and saw the Chariot at one of their very first Cornerstone appearances, and uh, I remember too because we were uh, we were standing there and Scott Mellinger from Zayo walked up behind us and he was like, "Are you guys ready?" And I was like, "I I, I mean, I guess I'm ready." And uh, it was incredible. And actually, um, I'm on the Chariot's DVD. <laughs> yeah, you're like right front and center, both arms yeah. in the air. Slow yeah. motion. Yeah, so you you know, you guys can look out for that. And uh yeah, I'm actually uh famous now because of that. And <laughs> I don't know if well. that's true, but you know, super famous. Definitely not well, the uh, band, just that guy that was in the crowd. No paychecks have come your way, as we know. Oh man, I get all kinds of paychecks. You gotta put that on the Discuss Metal credit card. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah. That was an insane show. What I remember from it the most is Josh got up on stage. He created the same my first rodeo. And then the guitarist like started thrashing about so bad. And then he just jumped right into the crowd and the band just went nuts. I don't remember. Like, I know, obviously, if he started the set off like that, the first song was before there was Atlanta. There was Douglasville. I don't remember what any of the other songs that were played were. They must have only been on stage for like 18 minutes. I mean, it was pretty much what I I was expecting because Josh had that reputation built up for being a Norma Jean. We'd heard a few songs by The Chariot at that point on like mp3.com because we're old farts. And uh, they had like a three song demo. And I remember just being all this hype that like Josh left Norma Jean and Norma Jean wasn't going to be good anymore. And this band of the chariot was going to like carry on, you know, that legacy, which is so funny to think about it. Like the stuff that we used to talk about is scene kids 
at that time, you know, oh, they're going to carry on the legacy. They're going to carry on the legacy. But like they, Norma Jean had one album out and the Chariot had like a 28 minute thing uh, that yeah. they yeah. were working on, which I guess will uh, lead us into the first album. You want to read that album title for me? Yeah, here we go. Everything is alive. Everything is breathing. Nothing is dead. Nothing is bleeding. 2004. And that by far is not the shortest uh, titled thing on the album. Give it a couple yeah. years. It could be the entire track listing. It could be. I mean, this is the weird thing about the chariot amongst many things. It's all subversion. So Josh is the kind of guy that he's going to be anti everything. So on this album, he's anti good production <laughs> in the sense of we're going to we're going to plug everything in. We're going to level it as good as we can and we're just going to play all the songs. There's a note inside of the inside of the booklet that says, "Hey, just wanted to apologize if there's any mistakes or anything weird. We did as good as we could. All the music that you're hearing is played by human beings uh, in real time." <laughs> and um, it definitely sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, they recorded it totally live, just, you know, mics into the amps and, you know, they didn't master it or anything, um, you know, which gives it that, you know, sound that it has. But unfortunately, I mean, for me, you know, listening to it with modern ears, I feel like I have to turn it up a lot more just to get any kind of punch out of it, um, you know, which I mean, that's that's the way that goes sometimes. It's the presented sequel to Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child. The concept of the band is rehearsed as best as they can be. Then we just mic everybody up and play the record. Yeah. You know, the fact that it was recorded live, though, uh, does present some uh, really interesting uh, effects that the album has that other albums don't, like just straight up feedback as part of the songs and notes was totally, you know, different than things I've heard before. And that I thought was just amazing to me. 2004 years, you know, I ate that up so much. Well, yeah, when this record came out, I thought it was incredible. Like, I thought it was the greatest thing that anybody had ever recorded in the history of man. I was like, this is the real stuff. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody is as raw as the chariot. Nobody's as crazy as the chariot. And, you know, Josh sounds completely inhuman. He sounds, uh, this album, he sounds the most like he did on Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child. And I don't know if it was because he had, like, maybe a little bit of distortion on his voice like he was like singing through an effects pedal or something like that there's definitely a little bit of added distortion on bless the martyr and it sounds similar to that on this record but i can't verify it it could have just been the way he sounded maybe he was cupping the mic or or something like that um yeah. but the, the thing that drives me nuts about listening to this now and i feel like such a wimp for even saying it but that ear shredding feedback that you hear constantly throughout this record it takes me to a place mentally that makes me uncomfortable because like you know i've played in a lot of bands that you know practiced in garages and in the early days i would sing through a guitar amp it was like the best we could do we'd that was all we had we'd play yeah, we'd, <laughs> plug, we'd plug a microphone we'd plug a microphone into the amp and every single time i would stand like directly in front of the amp or too close to it with the microphone it would feed back and it would make that sound. So every single time I hear it on the album, I hear Joe being like, Dan, you're standing too close to the amp. You need to get away from it. <laughs> it's like your own personal hell. <laughs> it is, dude. It really is. And it's, it, and it's sad because the material on here is really cool. Like the riffs are good. Uh, Josh's one-liners. I mean, did the dude is just a one-liner machine when it comes to just repetitive stuff to scream over the breakdown. Like, the dude's got, I mean, the devil is in Atlanta, army surrounded. The devil is in Atlanta, army surrounded. I don't know what any of it means, but it sounds awesome. And, uh, you know, my closet holds no bones over and over and over again. And I know Josh is a deep guy and all these lyrics have like really deep meanings behind them, but they're so weirdly obtuse in places, you know, just like this ain't my first road. This ain't my first rodeo or rodeo as he says it. Um, 10,000, 10,000 marching on, moving on <laughs> to the grave. I sing a new song. I sing a new song. Like, again, it's got to all be very personal to him, but it's just very strange. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's gobbledygook in a lot of places for me. Um, but I know that like I'm, I'm probably the problem with that. Like if I dug into it, you can you can find some pretty profound stuff in some of Josh's one liners, uh, yeah, even I mean, on this album. I mean, all the albums are pretty short, you know, at clocking in at like a half hour each. So 
Yeah. Maybe all, all them lyrics give you something else to do. <laughs> well, Josh is often listed as the lead vocalist and band leader, eliminating the possibility that he just has a huge ego and he wants the title of the guy in charge. I feel like he is presenting raw emotion with his music. And for him, that is in order to present what I want to the audience to make them feel what I want them to feel. I need you guys to be flexible and play the songs the way I want them to be played. Because I never get the impression that he is standing over in the corner telling everybody what note to play. He's very much the kind of guy to point and say, do something right now, and then adapt his vocals to that. 20 minutes later, it's the new song by The Chariot. Almost kind of like, I want to convey this emotion, and he leaves it up to his bandmates to figure that out. That sounds like a Dan Terry thing. Totally. I mean, <laughs> do the least amount of work and take the most amount of credit. I mean, that's pretty much the, that's pretty much like the name of my autobiography. I mean, you know. uh, yeah, and The Chariot had a... I mean, Josh is like the only one of the only um, original members all the way through the entire career. That's correct. Um, yeah, like, because they rotated uh, artists so much, um, you know, different uh, bandmates and stuff. Um, yeah, I think he's the only one who stayed throughout the entire career. Well, and what's interesting, too, is the amount of hype that went into the chariot before they even had an album out. Because, again, it was, you know, the, the, the hype of the chariot can largely be placed in the hands of Less Than Martyr Kiss the Child. I mean, from Norma Jean. I mean, those. That album was so so huge for people at that time. And then the idea of like, hey, the guy left, but he's in this other band that's kind of doing the same thing. You know, there were dudes from Norma Jean, even whenever Josh would show them tracks from the chariot, be like, oh, it just sounds like new stuff from us, you know? And um, but if you if you really peel back the layers, you will find that, uh, especially on this album, Norma Jean had much had much more musical complexity to its composition like the first time you hear bless the martyr kiss the child you're like this is just random noise but like when i listen to it now i hear all of the different types of uh, all the riff changes all the composition how it's all every song on that album is kind of a work of art whereas this album is kind of like it gives you that same feeling but it's more like achieved using just cheap tricks than it is like really hard work position you know which actually the chariot as we go on in their discography is going to turn that into a strength it yeah. is that is that kind of on the fly songwriting yeah you know and i think um they do some really cool stuff on this album for instance and then came then that's what i was gonna and, bring up yeah the, i mean and then came then is just it's probably the most complex song on the record and probably reminds me the most of norma jean you know, and it's like, you know, it's got this whole like old Southern glory type of weird <laughs> intro uh, to it. And it's, you know, he comes in with like the guttural death vocals, which, you know, is something that unfortunately he really doesn't ever do again. Um, but it sounds cool. And um, it starts off just like any other chariot song, like once you get past the intro. Um, and then before you know it, everything just kind of like, it starts slowing down. The guitars start feeding back. Everything just kind of rings out until it disappears. And the effect is the effect is like, for lack of a better word, like pretty breathtaking. Like it feels epic. Like it feels like, um, like in season one of The Walking Dead when Rick Grimes is in the literally in the middle of Atlanta, and like there's like all these zombies like surrounding him, and he's like inside of a tank surrounded by zombies like that like this evoked that before that was even a thing you know <laughs> and um now now i can't separate that visual image from the the audio that i'm hearing and um it goes it, it has this melodic ending to it where they bring the intro music back over the band playing like it's it's the most melodic moment on the album but it's so epic and so rich yeah that it's like i'd listen to this album just to hear that song I mean, pretty much that's what I do. I listen to track one, track four, and track five, and then, you know, I, I'm pretty much done at that point. Move, move uh, on to the fiancé, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, yep. it's not that anything else is bad. It's just that those are, like, the ones that stand out the most for me. Um, yeah. You know, because, like, it's all about when and then came then comes on, and that that track is just absolutely amazing. And thankfully, like, that becomes a trend in the rest of their albums. They always have 
that one epic song, track. an epic track that is like that song. And I'm always, you know, so happy to hear it when it comes on. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it's uh, it's interesting to hear that type of melody come out of this band. And it, it does kind of like if you if you listen to this album without this track on it, you're not going to go back in and look for a deeper meaning behind any of the music. You're just going to be like, well, that was a super crazy balls out insane record. Yeah. And, and this, you, but you're going to move on. This shows that the band is not, you know, like they like to play chaotic, crazy spaz core or whatever. But and then came then shows, you know, sure. Yeah. The rest of our stuff is all feedback laden and all this stuff. But we know how to write a song when we want to, you know, write a quote unquote song, you know. And um, so I think it's like their song to point at and be like, we know what we're doing. We just choose to do this. Yeah. And uh, I think the other one, the only other one that I really kind of get a similar vibe to is uh, The Bullet Never Lies and Time Will Prove All Things, an allegory of unfaithful Jerusalem. Um, that song kind of has a little bit more of an epic feel right from the beginning, but uh, it, it quickly turns just into a chariot song yeah. uh, <laughs> after that. Uh, Yellow Dressed Lock Knees is makes me want to kill myself when I hear it because like it just starts off with all this feedback. Which is, it's like literally the most, like almost grindcore, <laughs> like <laughs> insanity that it kicks in with. And uh, which is funny because when Buddy and I did the radio show, uh, I would always request to hear that song. Like I was always like, yeah, if we're going to play the chair, we got to play Yellow Dress, Locked Knees. And uh, <laughs> that was uh, that was always a ton of fun and probably scared the crap out of anybody that was listening. Yeah. And uh, and you'd never play the Skeezix Dilemma. I think we did once. We. We actually had a night, this is off topic, but uh, we actually had a night where Buddy and I were just like so burned out on doing the show. We like didn't care at all. So we played like, <laughs> played we played stuff. like, we, we played like a 17 minute uh, Paramecium song. <laughs> like, and then we play, it's like, how do we fill this two hours as quickly as possible so we can go home and, uh, and get Jack yeah. in the box on the way home? Get Jack in the box. <laughs> yeah. And then we, I think that was the night we watched Zombie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think we I think the Skeezix dilemma was in there. But uh, anyway, but yeah, we would play this song and uh, we played that super long Norma Jean song off of Bless the Martyr. Uh, oh yeah, played like a bunch of ten minute songs. And I actually remember too because the guy that was like in charge of us or whatever, like said that like the station manager wanted to talk to him about the midnight show, <laughs> and it was like right after we did that. But he never did end up talking to us about it. But like, it yeah, we quit fun. shortly after because it was way too late on a Saturday night. <laughs> It was just getting to be too much but uh back on the chariot this was um i mean this was gospel to people that loved norma jean at that time and wanted to hear more of josh i mean you definitely get that um but i have to say you know here in 2020 listening to it i'm like yeah this could have been a lot better like this this is while it may aesthetically seem similar to bless the martyr kiss the child by norma jean it is it is a cosmetic similarity it, it's not really as good yeah. and it sounds like a garbage can and I mean, it's, it's not a, something that i can really just sit down and listen to really anymore yeah it's a great introduction to the band uh but all the other albums that they put out um just you, you didn't think at the time that anything could top this album and they just continually do it you know so thankfully it just gets better from here there's only one complaint really that i have about this album and that has nothing to do with the band itself but modern technology because i can never see uh without going on the internet the full title of track two someday in the uh, yeah i'm gonna read it why don't you read that off for us buddy Someday, in the event that mankind actually figures out what it is that this world revolves around, thousands of people are going to be shocked and perplexed to find out it was not them. Sometimes this includes me. That track is almost that title is almost as long as the track itself. Say, so wouldn't it take you as long to read that as to hear the song? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> That's rough. Uh, yeah, yeah. My my music player always cuts out at someday in the event that mankind or actually figures out. It's usually right around there is when it cuts out. Yeah, I think on my on my music app it just says, uh, yeah. Let me see if I can, if I can pull that up on my app here real quick. It's yeah, it just says someday in the event that mankind dot dot dot. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of funny. <laughs> I bet whoever I bet whoever was coding that into like Spotify was like, seriously, guys, <laughs> we're uh, doing this. Come on yeah, now, let's come on. Well, and I mean everything about this record was a subversion too. You know, this was trying to be very anti-hardcore in the sense of like even even the title 
you know, everything is alive, everything is breathing, nothing is dead, nothing is bleeding. It was a kind of a subversion to hardcore, which everything was like blood of the martyrs or, you know, the death yeah. of, of ignorance or the death of whatever, you know. Um, and so he just wanted to say, yeah, no, nope, it's fine. Uh, we're going to put out this really heavy album, but we want to let you know everything's alive, everything's breathing, nothing's dead, nothing's bleeding, you know. <laughs> like, uh, and it was just kind of like, it's kind of a throwaway joke, but it does have kind of that meaning. Speaking of throwaway, uh, it's pretty early in 2020, so let's break the EP rule. Yeah, let's do it. Let's break it. Uh, because some of the things that I that I complained about on um, what I complained about with the first album was that you know it just sounds bad. Like there's just too much feedback. The songs don't really they seem kind of like they were written on the fly or whatever. Well, in 2005 they put out an EP called Unsung, which had two songs. Uh, the one was called Yanni Depp, and the next one was called uh, the other new one was called Kenny Gibbler play the piano like a disease but the other four songs on the ep are just reworks and re-recordings of songs that were on the first album except this record is like way cleaned up in the production department like it yeah. sounds like a professional recording yeah it's way better which is amazing sounding and like it was super catchy lots of great stuff going on in here uh it was one of those things that just kind of you know, you wanted a little bit more and they gave you a little bit more and definitely it was only a little bit. Yeah, for sure. But it was kind of like, in my opinion, the best versions of these songs. Like when I want to hear before there was Atlanta, there was Douglasville, I'm going to listen to the Phil Cosby version. I'm going to listen to Sergeant Savage. You know, I'm going to listen to Donnie Cash and Vin Affleck. You know, they're like, the, they are, you know, these songs redeemed in a way. Yeah, and uh, the first song though, Yanni Depp, such a cool song. Um, it's hard to talk about this EP without talking about the misheard lyrics videos. Oh man, uh, I, I watch that at least like three times a year. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's still, the greatest thing ever. It's still the funniest thing. So like, there's a song where he's like, "You're drowning in ankle deep water. You're drowning." And of course, no, they're like, "You're drowning. You're drowning." Oh, I see what you're saying. Never mind. Yeah, Yo, the, cut the that misheard. Part. Yeah, the misheard. <laughs> the misheard lyric is uh, is trouting so just, you're trouting in ankle deep water you're trouting you know there's a part uh in, in another song where he's all like he's like i sing and yeah it's before Atlanta. there was douglasville where he says uh you know i sing a new song i sing a new song i have a song i sing a new song and uh the misheard lyric is i have a son i shake my son <laughs> <laughs> There was the, uh, he's like, this world is full of bl of white teeth and black lungs. And the misheard lyric is, this world is full of white trash and black love. <laughs> like the funniest thing. And, uh, yeah, like that, that made this, that, that made this band so much more fun to me. I feel like those videos are like required watching when you're approaching this EP. Yeah. I'm trying to find that video because Joe, we need to put that in the show notes and uh, link to yeah. that. I'll have to find it later. I'll let you uh, be in charge of that. Yeah. Cause that video is so freaking funny. 2007, the fiance. Can I mention something really interesting about this record? What it happens if I off, say no? Uh, I don't care. I'm going to keep going anyway. <laughs> it starts on a roller coaster. I don't know if you ever listened to it, really, but you hear Josh going, bah! and you hear people screaming in the background. I'm I'm about 90% sure this was captured on a roller coaster. <laughs> like, this is just how Josh Scogan rides roller coasters. <laughs> I'm just picturing him at the top of the Batman. <laughs> he hits you on back-to-back, -back, the first track. He hits you with some of the best one-liners you've ever heard and it's like all the lyrics it's only a minute 33 but i just love it so much uh he's like this is the last chance you get open wide we both know we're both gonna die there's a difference between you and i you want peace but refuse to fight and like it's just so deep like and it hits you with a punch like you know that this is this is more this recording is more raw than the unsung ep but it's not as raw as the first album. Yeah, and so there's you, still really great production on this one. You can hear everything really clearly, and everything punches a lot harder on this record. And uh, it's just, I mean, the one-liner at the end, uh, churches have nuns, cowboys got guns, everyone's waiting to die. Like, the rule of cool was in full effect on this record. They kind of swung at the gate. Or they they kind of came out of the gate swinging on this one because I feel like really they had something to prove because a lot of the stuff that we complained about about the first album, 
oh, it just sounds like the songs are this, or it sounds like it wants to be Norma Jean. Uh, this record is a definitive change in that direction. They don't sound like Norma Jean on this at all. Yeah, they, they're they not as chaotic as they were, um, you know, in my opinion, because um, I... I don't, I'm, they don't really didn't use feedback as like a, uh, you know, a secondary instrument or anything on this album, uh, but just really, really tight uh, song structure, songwriting, and it was super heavy. Um, you know, it's definitely heavier than their first album. There's a, uh, there's a huge influence of punk rock on this too. You know, there's a lot of like Nirvana ish, grunge ish type of riffs that are used to create the chaos instead of it just be like, like they've kind of, you know, I called them cheap tricks on the first record and they really avoid that very well like there still is a lot of feedback on this but it's not as ear splitting and uh yeah like you said it's not a second instrument now it's just kind of like it's just feedback yeah. you know and um you know i gotta mention the track titles you know this is an old thing that we've all heard when we were kids back to back they faced each other they drew their swords and shot each other the deaf policeman heard the noise then came to kill the two dead boys and then there's forgive me nashville and the trumpet which is just like okay i guess we're gonna stop doing the thing now on track eight <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm pretty sure Josh Gogan just writes down a series of sentences and then says, here's the track listing, guys. I think that's part of the chaos and the emotion that he's trying to convey. He's trying to detach the name of the song from the actual music. I think he succeeds over these five records, not so much the unsung EP. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really give you like a hint of anything of what it's going to be about, like the trumpet is a has no trumpets in it b um is actually a like a group of uh churchgoers singing a hymn you know which is yeah. really cool uh just an interesting way to end the album uh but you know yeah the track title has absolutely nothing to do with what they're talking you know what's going on with the song yeah and it's it's funny the reason i the reason i brought up nirvana specifically in the influences is there's a song uh i think it's track five yeah the deaf policeman the deaf policeman like about a minute into the song goes into a straight lift of the song Tourette's by nirvana <laughs> It's the dan and dan and dan and dan and like it. It sounds like it's. It has to be intentional. Like at that point, it has to be intentional. It's like the first Tony Danza record all over again. That's not Sweet Child of Mine, but it might be. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> You'll never know. And then, uh, uh, in keeping with uh, their new theme of epic tracks, uh, then came to kill is track seven. That's their like, um, you know, epic track, which. This one has Haley Williams of Paramore, who was yeah. just getting big right around that time, too. Or maybe it was before then. I don't know. I don't remember. But This is also the song that appeared on the Unsung EP as uh, Kenny Gibbler played the piano like a disease. Yes. What's interesting about this song, too, is I really... This is one of those situations where there's two versions of the song, and I like both versions for different reasons. Uh, the first one I like is because, well, it's the epic track on the on the EP. You know, they still even on the EP gave us the epic track. What I think is very interesting is that they they keep it pretty much straight with the melody and him screaming over it. It sounds more like and then came then on unsung. On this one, whenever they bring uh, whenever they bring Haley from Paramore in, it changes that melody at the end in a, in a big way, and actually the song comes across even more emotional than it did originally. Yeah, and of course, even even during the pretty epic melodic stuff, there's still really awesome one-liners like "Just because you kiss, that don't mean that you're in love," or "Just because you kiss a lot, that don't mean you're in love," and "Just because you've begun doesn't mean that you've won." <laughs> <laughs> I love the stuff that he says. There's another song where he's like, how can I smile while the vampires sing? I must confess, I live my life up in a tree. <laughs> oh, Come on, man. Josh, okay. really? <laughs> you know, I mean, one of my favorite moments on the record is on Forgive Me Nashville, how he just starts off with the word basically. And it sounds as, it sounds as good as you can start a song with basically. He's like, basically, everything's going wrong. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's awesome. Uh, Josh's vocals are notably different on this record as well. So he's still screaming hard, but he doesn't sound like he did on Everything's Alive, Everything's Breathing. He, He's like, they've lost that Norma Jean sound in every, in every sense of the word. 
where now whenever you hear Josh Scogan's vocals, you're not comparing it to Norma Jean or even the first Chariot album. You're hearing more of his actual speaking voice in the way that he screams. I, I, and I, I feel like, like as a vocalist myself, that you have your harsh voice that you figure out how to do when you're younger, but it's not until years later that you really kind of start coming into what you actually sound like. Yeah. And you have your, your own particular phrasing and the way you do things. And this record was the first one where it's like Josh Scogan, the record, like he he actually has his own unique voice in his own unique way of approaching everything. And that's going to carry them through to the end of their career as the chariot anyway. And uh, yeah. I just thought that, that that's an interesting turning point. This record is a turning point in what we expect out of the chariot because before this we like just expected it to sound like norma jean yeah this is definitely like when he gets his own sound separate from norma jean he's kind of come up with his own way of doing it and um it's very it's very fun to listen to because no you know he, his vocals don't sound like anybody else's they're very unique uh in my opinion um because so when you hear the chariot you know you're hearing the chariot absolutely 2009 wars and rumors of wars yeah i think i heard a guy that knows a guy that knows a guy that said that uh that that said that you know there might be a war somewhere <laughs> is know. there a rumor I, of a war or an actual war i i don't know possibly uh, both i think i don't know he might have made that up what no <laughs> that's ridiculous oh man so now there's something here that I have to know. What's up with the mouth fart that happens on track two at about a minute four? <laughs> well, buddy, they were making the record and they said to themselves, you know, buddy's going to be listening to this eventually. <laughs> yeah, we need to put like, something in just for him. He just like starts to say something. It just goes all daffy duck on it. And like, <laughs> He's got a glass jar know, response. Man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where you're just kind of listening, and then all of a sudden you just it <laughs> just takes you right out of it. You go, "Yep, that, I heard that." It is kind of weird. <laughs> Hang on, sorry. Um, okay, never mind. Sorry, there was like a word puzzle with this band. Like, it says that the song titles contain a hidden message. If you take the first and last letter of each song title and lay them out, it spells the end is nigh, and so am I. Yeah, that's, that's kind of why I paused there for a second because I was like typing them all out. <laughs> oh, you're trying like, to find it? Yeah, I was like, there's a message here somewhere. I probably should have done this before we did the episode, but it just kind of snuck up on me. Uh, this record, it, it very much continues on in the same vein as The Fiance. It's ver the very first time where The Chariot has kind of put out two records that, like, this is our new sound. And we're gonna we're gonna champion it. We're gonna we're gonna try to make it better. And what's interesting about this one is they they do the punk rock fast, you know, the, the faster paced songs. But the breakdowns on this record are absolutely savage in places. Yeah, this album was super heavy, and I remember thinking to myself that I love all the riffing that's going on on this album. Um, it's absolutely awesome to listen to yeah dude this the the uh the breakdown and teach is like one of the craziest that i've heard out of this band and one of the most like just brutal and it's not brutal like because i mean we're approaching a point now where heavy music has advanced to the point where you know the chariot's not exactly the heaviest thing around anymore but you know because you got bands like tony danza where you know you, as far as brutality goes and craziness you you could almost make the argument that it wipes the floor with stuff like this but they more than make up for it with the level of energy this is just straight balls to the wall stuff 100 percent. and they don't actually slow it down until like we're more than halfway through the album yeah and i think like you know they keep their sound you know particularly on this not quite as fast you know uh you know kind of thing like you know like we talk about how the song structures aren't quite as crazy as they could be like tony danza is but i think that's because that's also in service of the live show um because they want to be able to play these songs like crazy and not stand there like a bump on a log because they have to figure out how to pull off these crazy complicated riffs well they didn't have josh travis that, that was the problem yeah that's true. Uh, but <laughs> What I think is interesting, too, is that so like if, if you want to make the Tony Danza comparison, too, is that Tony Danza was still more firmly rooted in like brutal metal, whereas the Chariot is kind of more based in like hardcore and punk. 
and so it's going to have a different a different type of intensity yeah and um i mean you're basically just brutalized for six tracks in a row on warm on wars and rumors of war and you get to track seven which is abandoned which is going to be what buddy would consider to be the uh, epic track on the album yeah <laughs> which starts off with like i mean i don't really have any other way of explaining it other than it's like cowboy music <laughs> <laughs> which is great what the hell are you looking at over there <laughs> Well, and it kind of it kind of follows the, the 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 fake out rule of like don't let anybody know if it's an interlude track until you absolutely have to, uh, because it's like a minute and a half in a three minute song before Josh even starts singing, and uh, it it slowly builds in intensity all the way to the end. I say slowly for a three minute song, and then you're you're back in brutalization territory by the time you get to the end of it. But it is a super epic track, and it's probably my favorite track on the album. Yeah, I love all of their um, epic tracks that they have, which, you know, my favorite is going to be on the very last album, but, you know, we'll get to that, you know, really soon here. But uh, I have to complain a little bit about the way this album was packaged. I'm an old person, or I'm getting to be an old person. I don't like it whenever I don't get a full CD, like Jewel Case, front and back. This was in the era of the digipack. Everybody was like, oh, it's got to be a digipack. And I think everybody was trying to like save on plastic by not releasing plastic product CDs, which is hard because like by 2000 and, you know, 2009, it pretty much between 2000, 2007, 2009, the, the uh, music industry was pretty much tanking anyway. So then it's like, well, now there's stipulations on the CDs you can put out. <laughs> Yeah. But what I thought was interesting about this one, or not really interesting, but kind of frustrating, is that I basically this album is almost like a it's like a fold out paper type of thing. I mean, it's cool. Like my copy's hand numbered and signed by Josh, which is cool. But um, like, I don't know. I just I wanted just to have a CD with a spine. And, you know, it's not as bad as what it's not as bad as what Coheed and Cambria did uh, later on where their album just came in like a slip sleeve. Uh, uh, but that that really that really pissed me off. The but. answer to your complaint is manufacturing costs and inventory space. It's a hell of a lot more cost effective when your CDs are this wide versus this wide. And for those that cannot see what I'm doing because it is an audio podcast, the jewel case versus the slip sleeve or the fold out sleeve. Those millimeters add up if you're the big record company trying to stay afloat in 2009 when the internet had thoroughly taken over and digital music was finally starting to get figured out. I got it, Dan. Just think about them as like uh, little uh, little vinyls. They're like mini vinyls. How about that? Buddy, that is an amazing <laughs> observation. So can we build like Barbie's Laserdisc collection with tiny CDs? Like little half size <laughs> disc from the fucking 90s with the D- Doom demo or Quake demo, whatever the hell it was. <laughs> I'm it's not only amused. this big. <laughs> I am not amused. But Dan, it's a little vinyl. You like vinyl, right? So it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's not made out of vinyl. <laughs> They're both plastic, it technically. Technically. Yeah, I don't know. I just I like my CDs to sit on the shelf and be noticeable and not have like little tiny things stuck in between them. But whatever. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a banger of an album. And, you know, really, they, they, they continued their legacy really well with that one. I do think that this record is kind of middle of the road with them in that, like, they did exactly what I expected and nothing more. But yeah. that's that's fine. Like, it's, yeah, cause, it's uh, fine. Because I'm racking my brain, like, thinking about this one. And, like, it's like a, you know, you enjoy it, but there's nothing really to, like, stand out and talk about with it. Because it's not the new thing and it's not a new version of the sound. It's more of the chariot, which is fantastic. But, you know, it's it's a sure thing. Are we ready for Absolutely. Long Live? Oh, yeah, dude. This record is killer. 2010. Does anybody else feel like the Chariot just goes into the studio, sets a time limit, and pulls out a record? Uh, the, th- the time limit is, you know, 30 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to prove <laughs> that we're serious, you have 28 minutes. minutes. This is one of the most fun discographies to go through, not just because the music's cool, but uh, also because, uh, you know, it's not like a... You can knock out their whole discography in like two and a half, three hours. Yeah, I mean, over the course of a week, I listen to each album at least like three or four times. It's not American Standard ridiculous, but it is ridiculously short. <laughs> so what sets this one apart from the fiancé? Or everything is alive, everything is breathing. That's hard to put a finger on because it doesn't sound like those records, like in the sense that they're different songs, obviously, but like 
I don't know. This this is hard to put a finger on because it definitely sounds different. I just think that the songwriting is a little bit better than what we had on Wars and Rumors of Wars. I don't know if it's better than the fiance, but uh, they're doing like different stuff. They're, like they're finding ways to be chaotic that we're not really expecting. And they actually go in the epic direction two times on this CD instead of just once. And, um, well, now almost three times, actually. It, this is actually probably their most melodic record, in my opinion. Which may yeah. be why it uh, did so well. Because, I mean, you know, this one was a big hit with everybody I knew. And I thought the internet loved it, you know, back when it came out. This is my favorite Chariot album, like, out of everything that they've done. Um, you know, and it starts off as brutal as possible. Like it's all feedback starting it off. And I, again, I'm feeling like I'm standing in front too close to the amplifier while I'm singing, you know? And, uh, I mean, it, the song Evan Perks, it's just like a minute and a half beat down. Um, and the, the dissonance that they use is almost liquid. Like I can't even like, it's, I'm sorry, every now and again, I'll describe something like in a weird way, but like it, the, the dissonance that they use is like very, very thick, very liquid almost, and like carries the song in an odd way, the way it rings out. It sounds like they're making it up as they go, but they've but been directed in way, a yeah. certain way. So I think the title of band leader is very accurate in this case. Because Josh is just pointing in the direction he wants them to go, and the band is delivering. That's also why many of the riffs are arguably incomprehensible. They're just noises. So you're kind of like likening them to like a good jazz band, you know, where they don't necessarily have a song. They just start figuring some stuff out, and they play off each other. Absolutely, and that's important. When you're a band, you got to be able to play off each other. Unless you're in Dream Theater, then you got to be able to play what we write on the page. <laughs> well, I would say I would say the first three, the first three songs on this record definitely beat you down pretty hard. Like they're just like let's throw it all. I mean, it's only like seven minutes of audio, but uh, or maybe even like six or five. I don't know. It's like not very much, uh, but it's all beat down. What track is the, the one that has the part where that cuts into like that old timey like? Well, we'll get uh, there. We'll get yeah. There. So <laughs> track four, the city, is where they first start going epic. Where it starts off pretty much like a beat down, like you'd expect from what you'd had. And then they start doing a build about two minutes into the track. And it seems like it's building in crazy intensity. And then suddenly it goes like positive, like melodic on you. And Josh is just singing as the riffs sing out. He, of course, has awesome one liners like I saved my money, but he can't save me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and all this stuff. Well, one if by land, two if by sea, yada, 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 yada. And then it actually ends up, and he screams out, this is a revelation, and it, it ends in, like, a gang vocal, which is yeah. just, like, totally, was totally unexpected. I'd never heard anything like that on a Chariot record. This was kind of the first time where, instead of them sounding like a band playing in a garage somewhere, they actually sounded like they were playing an event, like a live show. Like, it has that, it has that epic feel to it. Like, everybody is rushing the stage and... Yeah. You know. Well, yeah, because he's like, you know, this is only a revolt, and then you have backup screams that are going at the same time, you know? And uh, it sounds amazing you know it sounds really yeah. cool it sounds like it sounds like people are rushing the stage and grabbing the mic while josh is singing and it it adds a lot man i don't really think does. this is the only one i definitely don't think it's the first time the fiance and everything is alive everything is breathing were very intentionally made to sound like a live band this one may have the dynamics or it may have just been engineered better to describe and present what the band sounds like and give you that feeling. But they all have a running theme of, it's a live band. This is what it sounds like when a live band gets on stage or gets in the studio and makes a record. Well, to speak to what you're talking about, buddy, uh, which is uh, track seven, David De La Haz. Ah, David De La Haz. Favorite Chariot song of all time. <laughs> because it starts off really intense, and they actually get to a point where they're playing so fast and there's so much chaos going on, so much dissonance. Dude, yeah. they go like straight up horde sounding insanity building into that. You're in the middle of a chariot song and you're going and you're going and you're going and you're going. And then suddenly out of nowhere, you hear <laughs> you hear a voice 
you know, kind of clear their throat. And Dan Smith from Listener just comes in and starts doing his thing. I don't know if you guys have ever heard Listener or not. Um, if you like this guy's vocals, he has whole albums out like this. <laughs> And um, they're like spoken word to music. You know, it's not obviously this heavy, but uh, this was, in my opinion, the chariots Memphis will be laid to waste in, in the sense that it's obviously not the same song. It's not a copy because Josh yeah. isn't like that. You know, he doesn't just try to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, but man, the, his vocal is awesome with that weird, like dissonant backbeat going under his uh just really chaotic delivery and he's just talking like i mean it just it's like you know <laughs> head inside a hand turning over again together you know like yeah it's, it's, like, rawr, 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 rawr. Yeah, it's <laughs> got this real weird uh rhythm to his, to it's, his voice it's, it's like if aaron weiss from me without you was from like the deep south <laughs> the deep <laughs> south the deep <laughs> south yeah like i mean it's just <laughs> You know, like this, it, he sounds like, and everything he's saying is like super profound. Like, I don't want to take away from that. Like, it's all very intelligent, very intentional, and it sounds great. But uh, what's funny about it is just that, um, like, you know, I talk to dudes like this in gas stations, like out in southern Missouri, you know, who <laughs> like, um, they're like, that's just legit how they talk, you know? And yeah. um, you're like, oh, yeah, you want me to, you want me to fill her all up with, uh, with some gasoline? I got some, I got some really great power tools, you know, I, uh, I got these. I got this here Dewalt drill, and like it's uh, it's yellow. But you ought to see the one I got at home. It's a it's a Milwaukee, and you see that tool's red, you know, and it's, it's super cool and heavy and awesome and everything. You know, like it. I meet dudes like this all the time, like in my line of work, and so it's really fun hearing it like incorporated into a chariot song like this. Uh, but while still being very like subverting expectations, being very intentional, being very smart, and being very clever, it's they did he, they did such a good job on this song, and that's that's why it's my favorite chariot song. It's also one of the best videos you'll ever see by a hardcore band. They do the one shot through the studio thing, where it's very much planned out, but it's supposed to be a little mini movie. It's really cool. Yeah, it's a really neat video. I'm gonna have to go watch it again after we're done here. <laughs> And I think that that song qualifies as an epic track just because of that. Pretty much any Chariot song that's longer than three minutes is an epic track. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Like, uh, Robert Rios is an epic track, even though it's only two minutes. Because, you know, what if if I'm going to say something, why wouldn't I just contradict myself the next second? <laughs> uh, exactly. But uh, you also may be wondering why this album has so many just people's names as the song titles. You have Evan Perks. You have Calvin McKenzie. You have Andy Sundwall, uh, David De La Haz, and uh, Robert Rios. And that was because these were actually fans of the Chariot that had won a contest. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, there's no deeper meaning behind the behind the names. It's just that they won a contest to have their name as a song on a Chariot album. Furthering my suspicion that the names of the songs are not important. And not at all. to prove yeah. that, we're going to eliminate your emotional attachment to those song titles. Yeah, and I think it's effective. It's just about what Josh is saying. It's not really about the track titles or anything like that. It's basically just a way to reference it. <laughs> it's time. 2012. One Wing. God, is it that old? I feel like this record came out like a year ago. I know. And man, is it my favorite Chariot album. Oh, Tell so us you're, you're... why. I love this one. <laughs> right, but why do you love it? <laughs> I know. Sorry, um, <laughs> I, I was. I had a. Uh, I had some. I had this page open. My notes, and I was trying to read. I had this it. open. It's <laughs> yeah. definitely not. Definitely not a popular internet site. None of this is going to be in the show. No, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a fun. It's a fun flub, though. Uh huh. Okay, hang on. Well, this one's definitely my favorite album. Uh, because like, I mean, it's it's definitely like really really weird. But I also love the, uh, the the sentence that the track title spells. Um, I love just the weirdness that is all throughout the record, especially like the song first, where they do that Western thing. Uh, but it works so well with Josh screaming over it. And I feel like it's it's super epic. Uh, I don't know. This was, I think, the first one where there was almost every track had something like to remember about it. One of the most important things about One Wing is that we knew going into it that it was going to be the final Chariot album. They had pretty much said from the beginning, we're going to put this last album out, which is a trend that I'm glad that bands do. You know, 
Uh, Sleeping Giant did it with their last record. They're like, yeah, we're going to put it out, but it's going to be our last one. Uh, even though the last record that they put out before that was called Finished People, which was not the end. It's a little bit of joke. a dissuade, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. But One Wing definitely, uh, it's everything that you love about the Chariot in 30 minutes. Like, this is almost like a collection of greatest hits, even though it's not. I mean, it, they are new songs, but a lot of the songs that they have on this record harken back to previous albums. Uh, even track three, Your, which is just like a, a woman singing, uh, Oh, Busy, Busy Bee, uh, Walking to and Fro, uh, What If We Close Our Eyes, What If We Don't Wake Up, uh, which was a, a throwback to um, a track on the fiance. I think it was um, They Faced Each Other. And um, so he was always like really proud of that lyric. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, you know, I don't, I don't blame him. But uh, this just feels like, like, you know, I'm talking about how since the fiance, they've really carved out their own song and proven to the world that they're not just the band that the dude that was in Norma Jean was in. Yeah, by this time, you know, that's a distant memory. And most people, you know, I mean, they, you know, they probably know it, remember it, but it's not something that you really care about at this point. Is it um, really a distant memory? Because I mean, I recall Josh Gogan always showing up at Norma Jean shows. You could almost flip a coin whether or not he was going to be there for Memphis Shall Be Laid to Waste. I think that just had more to do with uh, the fact that they were um, on tour together a lot. Yeah, always on the same bills or playing the same festivals and stuff. I think one thing that um, when you bring this album up that a lot of that I think we you know should definitely be talked about is that final track cheek um you know which is it's one of those like sleeper favorite tracks of mine by the chariot like i don't think i could sit there and just say like oh this is my favorite song by the chariot but i can't ever not listen to it um if there's one song by the chariot i'm gonna hear in a day i'm probably gonna put this one on um because the speech by charlie chaplin in from the great dictator that is in that song is amazing with the music that they put over it um because i went popping around on youtube looking for um other people that have done similar things with the speech from the yeah, movie the speech gets used quite a lot in popular media yeah yeah and there's a lot of people that do like stuff from inception and other like epic tracks and stuff but nothing comes as close as how epic they do it here because you know, those other songs that people lay over it weren't meant to go with the speech. But Josh wrote this song with the speech in mind. And so it carries so heavy and hard. And I feel like it just ends the Chariot's career on such an amazing note. Um, almost like, you know, like he starts off with everything is alive. Everything is, you know, breathing, like uh, trying to say that, don't worry, guys, you know, everything is fine. And then it's almost like at the end, he's using the speech as like his plea that like, um, you know, turn away from your hate, don't, you know, stand up and fight for what's right, you know, and stuff. Um, and it's it's just a, it's just a great track that uh, resonates really, really loud, loudly with me. It's one of the few times you can really say that I know what he's trying to tell me. Most of the time when you're listening to The Chariot, you feel a certain way when you're listening to it. But the lyrics may be incomprehensible as far as what the message actually is, although they may be cool lyrics to listen to and repeat. But this time, it's let's tie the whole thing together and realize that we're all human beings and just mellow out for a second. Yes, I know we're the chariot, but now I want everybody to calm down for just a minute. Well, this record has a lot of their most experimental stuff on it, like stuff that you really wouldn't hear on a Chariot record, like uh, the song Speak being like kind of like a slower uh, piano-driven type of song, which is something you don't really hear from this band. And of course, Josh just screams over it because it's still the Chariot. Oh, which is uh, so good because that dissonance is what makes it. Oh, yeah, totally. And really, I would... I would actually make the controversial argument that Speak might have been a better album closer than Cheek. Yeah, Cheek or Speak, keep them right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the track titles wouldn't have worked out, and Josh can't have that. So That's right. Um, you know, but yeah, I, th I thought Speak was, was really cool. Um, would have been a really cool end ending, but almost a little bit cheesier. 
what they did on cheek at the end especially i mean you so you have the song it builds up it's slower in pace you know which is something you'd be expecting at this point but i love the way after the after the speech is over that josh comes in he screams there's tons of feedback that just rings out they play heavy riffs and they just they end it right yeah and i mean because it just when it ends it's there's no note ring out or anything it just cut you know they just hit that final note and they're done well the feedback rings out a little bit at the end but yeah i, I no. understand what you mean it just maybe it i does. i don't know, i remember it just cutting I don't you gotta <laughs> but, stop listening to 96k crappy mp3s buddy <laughs> hey i'm listening to high quality stuff but high quality my ears aren't what they were high <laughs> my phone, quality my phone fills up as soon as i save it to local yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like two songs but they're like lossless wave files because while this band just plays, you know, dissonant screeching noises. While you're uh, listening in 320, I'm listening in 640. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. It's like they're right in my head. Do MP3s even go that high? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm There's just like, what's, what's highest? Double it. And then I'm going to say that. <laughs> There's definitely more melody on this uh, in in the form of interlude tracks and... They just threw a lot of cool stuff in there. Like, it was just like, guys, this is it. Any idea that anybody has, let's hear it now. You know, let's get it out there. Let's make the best possible record that we can because we're not going to come back and do this again. One Wing is just an incredible ending of their career, not only because they were a great band up to this point, but just because they this record adds the deeper meaning, I feel, to the rest of the material. You know, we've been talking ever since the first album about how there is a deeper meaning to all of it that there there's something more to it than just the riffs and the screams and the feedback and this record is the first one that takes that idea and runs with it and they're like yeah this this all has a point this is all coming to a head you know it's like it's like finishing a great tv series on netflix you know a show that didn't get canceled but a show that had a definitive beginning middle and end yeah and so you you finished listening to the chariots discography feeling complete they they had a complete thought you know they didn't just break up they didn't just decide oh we're not making enough money doing this we're done yeah it didn't feel like that they just decided we're done it felt like they 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 did what they wanted to do they took it as far as they wanted to go and they crafted an end to the whole thing um and they ended before they sucked (laughs) yeah You've got five, six, if you count the EP, solid albums to listen to that are all just bangers all the way through. Yeah, they never screwed up. I mean, the legacy is there. You know, I've been talking a lot about Furnace Fest and all that and how Furnace Fest is getting all these bands together, you know, to do these like final to do this final show or do a reunion show or something like that. And uh, I know they've been bugging Josh to do something. Well, first they asked him if he would do like a uh, Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child set. And he was like, no, I don't want to do that. And they're like, okay, but everybody really, really wants the chariot. And actually some dudes on a uh, some dudes on a Facebook shit posting group made a um, made a fake Furnace Fest announcement for the chariot. Jeez. Oh, and uh, Josh ended up getting really pissed off because he he took uh he took to social media and was like no this isn't happening this is fake anybody that's saying that it's happening is wrong you know it's not happening and he basically just said you know i'm doing 68 now and i don't like going back to the past i just want to move forward yeah i went and i saw their i think it was their second to last show um down in atlanta a friend of mine uh and i drove down to atlanta to watch in some you know crazy dive bar um one of their shows and i mean all the way up to the very end they're they're still just as crazy playing all this material off one wing and all the classics like you heard everything you wanted to hear at you know the last show and you know the the venue pretty much because you know it's their hometown and their last show they let them do whatever they wanted so of course josh is swinging from the rafters doing whatever um but yeah (laughs) i mean i could i could see why josh is also like looking to do something different because you go and see the chariot and you know this is what you expect and now you go see 68 and it's something totally different yeah it is and so i mean i i believe it that he's just moving on to a different chapter in his life but you know i also don't want to hear a bunch of you know if he'd kept going with the chariot i don't want to hear like five or six bad chariot albums that he recorded because he had to yeah or or I'm whatever you know ended. yeah I'm, I'm very glad it ended when it did 
you know, I'd rather go out on the high note than, you know, have to deal with a couple of stinkers and then maybe one more good one or something. You know, like, when is Inflames going to quit? <laughs> Hopefully tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Final thoughts on the chariot, buddy. Listen to all of it. You're not going to miss out on anything bad. Like, it's it's all great stuff. Um, if I had to pick one album to listen to... Um, if you wanted it for certain tracks, I would say One Wing. If you wanted a whole solid, amazing album, toss a coin between Long Live and The Fiance. Dan, what about you? I think if you like chaotic music, I think The Chariot is a must-listen band. They kind of wrote the book on how to be chaotic without using a whole bunch of cheap tricks. I mean, they did it once, but we're let it go. And they are just a band that was essentially a legend for a really long time. And, you know, now that they're gone, they, they're kind of reaching like cult status with, with some people that are just like, yep, it never got any better than the chariot. And uh, in a lot of ways, they're right. And uh, I think that uh, if you're not into like really noisy music, I would avoid it. But uh, I think for those of us that grew up on solid state bands, uh, the chariot was and still is a band that people are going to be talking about for years. I'm going to take that and expand on it. They created their own sound, their own presentation in a genre that was in the process of being defined. Not only did they create the blueprint for what chaotic hardcore is supposed to sound like, but they did something outside of it that no one else has successfully duplicated. There is a specific tone and a specific feel to every The Chariot record. Even Norma Jean changed the way that the record sounded over time. Most bands that are in any way, shape, or form underground change what you're going to get over time. The Chariot gives you pieces of that, but what you end up with and what you start with are in the same room together. So if you like hardcore, you should be listening to The Chariot. Buddy, what's your album of the week? Oh, shoot. Hang on. Okay. So my album of the week is The Burning Cold by Omnium Gatherum. Really great uh, opening track with uh, Gods Go First. Um, super good stuff. Damn, what about you? Mine this week is Rivers of Nihil. Owls Know My Name. And I'll get more into that on a Patreon episode that we're doing soon. And when you're not listening to that, it's Circle Back. It's always Circle Back. <laughs> Every morning. For me, it's Vanishing Lessons by Tourniquet. Who doesn't like thrash metal? Is that record thrash metal? Depends on what Sometimes. decade you're talking about. Sometimes it is. <laughs> Other times she's like, my promise. Take us out, DFT. If you've ever been listening to this podcast and you wanted to be more involved in the band picking process, well, it is a good year for that. There are so many different ways you can reach out to us and tell us what bands you want us to talk about on the show. You can reach out to us on Facebook under facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal. You can send us a message on Instagram under discography discussion. You can send us an email at Dan and Joe show at gmail.com. We have a Discord server that you can join. If you click on the link in the show notes, it will take you to our Discord server where there are people talking all the time about all things discography discussion. And there's a really good community there. We also have a fillable form. If you don't feel like going through all that stuff I just said, Joe has a link that he's going to put in the show notes. You can click on it. It'll take you to a form and literally ask you what bands you want us to talk about. And we'll talk about them eventually. And on that note, this has been episode 152 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Come here, buddy. You're the best around. Nothing's ever going to keep you down. You know, every time I do something really awesome at work, I'll play that at like full volume and just stand up and throw my hands in the air. It's pretty funny. 